Beautiful. Alrighty. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for another Secret Sunday session today. Today, I am joined by Jen from beautiful Amsterdam, which I have never been before. So hey, just yeah. Close to Amsterdam, but the Hague. Oh, okay. I, I should have got my facts right with that one. <laughs> um, so just to clarify and start off, who are you and what is it that you do? Um, so thanks so much for inviting me today. My name is Jen Salib Huber and I'm a Canadian trained uh, naturopathic doctor, dietitian and intuitive eating coach. And I work with women in perimenopause and menopause who are trying to really get an understanding of what's happening trying to um, understand the hormone changes that are causing some of these normal symptoms, but still can be life disrupting and trying to do it all from an intuitive eating, gentle nutrition approach. So trying to keep diet culture and the rules of diet culture and the fear mongering that comes with midlife body changes, just kind of on the outside of that conversation. So, um, you know, just helping women to transition through midlife so that they feel that they're at their best. Awesome. And if we just jump straight into it, what is menopause? Right. So when we talk about menopause, we're actually talking about a transition. And so the term perimenopause refers to the two to 10 years that lead up to menopause, which is when you have stopped having a period for 12 months. So we don't say that someone's in menopause until they've gone 12 full months without a period. Perimenopause actually can last, you know, 10 years for some women, depending on genetics and a few other things, it can start as early as 35. But for most women, this is happening in their 40s. And so perimenopause is what I call the moving target of midlife, because there's no consistency. There are kind of three distinct stages of very early, which is when women might be starting to notice changes in their cycles, might be starting to notice some newer symptoms like anxiety or sleep changes, but for the most most part are still having a really regular cycle. Um, traditional early and late perimenopause is kind of what we think of as the stereotypical woman who is having a lot of symptoms related to her period. So maybe it's late, it's early, it's missing, it's heavy, it's painful, um, along with things like hot flashes and mood swings and night sweats. So this is really a big chunk of women's life, right? So unlike pregnancy, which is nine months, give or take, perimenopause is often a decade out of a woman's life when she's often at her busiest, um, when the demands of life, whether that's working outside the home, uh, work that's at, you know within the home, taking care of family, taking care of aging, aging parents, whatever the deal is, um, it's a busy time of women's life. And it has historically not been well supported. Um, and there are lots of people, including me, who are trying to change that. Do we know why it I guess, triggers or w women experience menopause in their th late thirties, early forties. Like why is it that time that women get menopause? It really has to do with the eggs. So we are born with all the eggs that we're ever going to have. And as soon as we're born, even before puberty, we actually start to lose some. And by the time that we get to our late thirties and early forties, we have a declining pool of eggs and each of those eggs and follicles produces estrogen. So when we're in a normal cycle in our premenopausal years, so kind of teens, twenties, thirties, every month follicles produce estrogen and the, then the egg that matures, its follicle then lives and produces progesterone. So we have this predictable cycle of estrogen in the first half, progesterone in the second half, lather, rinse, repeat happens on a fairly regular cycle. But as our eggs get older and the number of eggs that we have declines, the cycles become less predictable and our bodies start to change on the inside and the outside because of what I call the changes in our hormonal soup, right? So in those first kind of 20s or first three decades, you know, your reproductive years, the soup that you're swimming in is really predictable. And, you know, for the most part, Yes, you may have some premenstrual tension or you may have some bloating before the start of a cycle, but it's not a surprise and you know why it's happening and when it's happening. In perimenopause, these fluctuations happen, especially with estrogen and progesterone, that just make it really difficult to know what's happening, when it's happening, why it's happening, and what you can do about it. <laughs> wow. And why is it that the body sends a person, a woman signals like hot flushes and feeling a bit dizzy and lightheaded? Like what is that 
What is the body telling you? You know, I don't, I don't know if I would phrase it as what is the body telling us? I think that th there are some symptoms and hot flashes are definitely one of them that tell us that there has been a sharp drop in estrogen and estrogen helps the part of our brain that regulates temperature. So the part of our brain that helps to regulate body temperature is also affected by that fluctuation in estrogen. So all of a sudden, it gets the mistaken signal that we need to cool off quickly. And so our, you know, that our body temperature is too high and it actually isn't all that high. It's just our brain thinks it is. And so we get hot, sends all the blood to the surface, we have a hot flash, we release the heat, we sweat, and then we get cold because we weren't, our body temperature wasn't ever actually elevated. Our brain just thought it was. So this is really kind of a symptom of, you know, these fluctuating estrogen levels and about how it affects so much more than just our uterus and our ovaries. Every cell in our body, basically every organ has receptors for estrogen and progesterone. So as those levels change, the function of those organs and how they respond to changes is also going to fluctuate. And what happens after menopause, after someone loses their period, does anything in the body change for a woman? So that's a great question. And I think that we're, um, we do know some things. So for example, we know that a lot of the symptoms go away for most women, not all. Um, women will reach a state of kind of a steady state of low hormones, which typically means that any of those really wild fluctuating roller coaster of emotions and things like that tend to settle out. So when they talk to women who are past menopause, they don't describe issues with sleep or mood anywhere near as much as women who are in perimenopause do. We do know that estrogen has some wider effects on metabolism. So for example, um, you know, estrogen can have an impact on uh, where our body um, you know, stores fat, for example. So, you know, we talk about how, it, you know, women often have this pear shape in their reproductive years, and there's kind of a natural shift to more of an apple shape. And, you know, we, we, I try to normalize that as much as possible because, you know, there isn't a whole lot that, that we can do about that. We can work on our health, but if we're trying to just prevent that shift from happening and we're just focusing on the shifting of where, you know, what our body looks like, we're not really treating the health part of it. So lots of women that I work with will come in and they'll say, my body's changed so much. You know, my clothes don't fit. Even if the scale hasn't changed, they're noticing that, you know, the distribution of things have changed. So we know that that's happening under the surface. We know that there's also a, a bit more of a tendency towards insulin resistance because estrogen seems to protect us a bit from that. Um, from a heart health perspective, estrogen also has some cardioprotective effects. So, um, you know, as women, we tend to enjoy kind of a reduced risk of heart disease until menopause. And then we kind of enter a little bit more of an on par category. And then there's bone health. So bone health and brain health are also kind of two areas that can be uh, impacted by the changes in estrogen. And these are all normal. I try and normalize that as much as possible, but that doesn't mean that we can't be proactive about what we're doing to try and mitigate those risks at this time of life. Yeah, wow, estrogen really plays an important role for the body. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So, so, you know, I think the, the thing with estrogen too is that there's a lot of fear in our culture around the loss of estrogen. So, um, you know, for women who are going through this, they often worry and, you know, have been sent the message culturally that, you know, they're past their prime and that once you become menopausal, you know, your useful years are over, you're, you know, you're no longer, you know, beautiful and whatever. Um, and I really try and, and encourage women to see it as just, you know, it's the next season. And, you know, every season comes with its own, um, you know, beautiful time and, you know, benefits and pros and cons and things we like and things we don't like. Um, but just like, I don't think we should compare puberty to, you know, our reproductive years. I don't think that we should be evaluating how we feel in perimenopause and menopause as a comparison to the other times in our life. You know, the shift in estrogen is normal. It can sometimes not be fun. And I absolutely encourage women to explore any treatment that helps them to feel better. Um, but I also would encourage them to look forward to it and not dread it. 
And that's what I feel like it is. It's even like in talk with my mum about going through her menopause journey and you, it's kind of, menopause has this stigma almost that, oh, she must be going through menopause. And it's, I don't understand that concept of it. Is it a stigma? There's definitely, um, there's some stigma. I think there's a lot of stereotypes. And I think that the hormonal stereotype has really been applied to women of all ages. You know, the women who are, you know, accused of being PMSy or being hormonal. Um, and while there can be some truth to explaining what's happening, I don't think that it benefits anyone to stereotype um, a woman in her 40s about what she's going through and why. So, and I think there is some stigma, or especially for women in the workplace. And there's been quite a bit of interesting research in that area that um, women don't feel like they can talk about it. Um, you know, the women that I work with often say that they feel really vulnerable um, being in the workplace, um, in going through this, where they might be having a hot flash in a meeting, or maybe they're not sleeping well, and so they don't feel like they're at their best. Um, you know, some women are experiencing a lot of physical symptoms that make it difficult for them to be at work. And, you know, they don't feel like they can talk to their employers about that. That is changing. There actually are some progressive employers, especially in the UK recently, who have, um, you know, acknowledged that women may need more time, uh, may need, you know, paid time off or that, you know, that kind of thing. But I think that the, the stigma of we should be able to just handle it, we should be able to just do it all, and the stereotype that our hormones are responsible for everything and, um, you know, isn't serving women. And getting back to you were saying when you go through menopause and then you lose that, that estrogen in your body, what can you do to, you know, prevent the, the cardiac disease and also the reduced bone health and things like that? So, I mean, there's never one thing, right? And so women who are going through perimenopause, and I encourage women to start learning about this before it all starts. Um, you know, I encourage women to prepare for perimenopause like they would pregnancy. So, you know, before women um, who are planning a pregnancy, you know, plan to get pregnant, they, you know, will often do prenatal courses, they'll talk to people about nutrition, and they'll try and do everything they can to have themselves in the best place possible to have a baby. And I really think that we need to start approaching midlife in the same way. So when it comes to bone health, for example, we need to be you know, really emphasizing to women that it's really all about, or mostly about trying to prevent bone loss. So the ability to build new bone starts declining from 30 onwards. You know? um, but if we don't smoke, if we try and limit things like alcohol and salt, um, you know, if we do weight bearing exercise, if we include foods that are rich in vitamin D and K and calcium, that we can support bone health beyond menopause, that it's not just about estrogen. Estrogen is a piece and it definitely increases the risk, but these are all things that we can be paying attention to in our thirties long before we're in menopause. Um, and similarly for heart health, I think some of the general heart health guidelines about um, you know, fish oils, for example. So, you know, having a diet that's high in fatty fish, especially those um, things like salmon, mackerel, herring, um, getting enough regular movement or joyful movement, as we call it in intuitive eating, so that you're moving your body as often as you can in ways that you enjoy, and not just for intentional weight loss, that you're really focusing on, you know, the, the joy aspect of it, but also the physical activity piece of it. Um, and then for some women, there can be the discussion around, um, you know, hormone replacement therapy, which is, you know, more often called menopausal hormonal therapy now. Um, and that for some women, and especially those who go into menopause early, which is clinically defined as before 40, uh, may have reason to look at that for prevention, um, you know, trying to mitigate the risks of, of spending the next 50 years in a lower estrogen state. So it's not just about hormones and it's not just about food. It's not just about exercise. Um, you know, that individual approach of what are your risk factors, um, what are the types of things that are modifiable risk factors, because some aren't, genetics aren't, for example, um, you know, is, is really, I think, what, what women should be looking for is kind of that individual approach to their health um, instead of the blanket approach to women's health. Yeah. I'm interested to know your take on supplements because I know they are a big thing and a lot of people do actively take them because they may not be getting it by food and all of that. But do supplements almost impact our hormone health as well? 
There can be. I mean, when you're talking supplements, are you, there's the, you know, vitamins, minerals, and there are things that are kind of don't fall into either of those categories, like maybe fish oil and probiotics. And then there's also herbal medicines. Um, and there are definitely some herbal medicines that have some hormonal impact. And as a naturopath, I use them all the time in the women that I work with to support estrogen or progesterone or other hormones that might be involved. And I think that there are, there is some evidence for kind of proactive supplementation in some cases. So for example, vitamin D. Um, I don't know exactly what the situation is in Australia, but I know coming from Canada and living in the northern part of Europe, we're all actively encouraged to take vitamin D because we just can't make enough of it, even if we're outside all day, um, to last us through the year. Um, there is also some evidence, for example, for, with fish oil. Um, there are, you know, for certain conditions, we might be looking at things um, on an individual level, but as a blanket statement, um, you know, I think that a food first approach is always going to be my first approach and I think is the most sustainable for most people. But there absolutely is evidence, but just not in a blanket statement. Everyone should take this other than vitamin D maybe kind of way. And, and that's, I think, the hard thing as well is how you get all those vitamins and minerals into your day when you're kind of not eating every second of the day and you kind of don't want to be calculating the vitamins and the minerals out of every meal that you eat. So how do you manage that? Well, and I don't think that you have to, you know, I think that um, that's somewhat of a, a diet culture or kind of nutritionism approach that we should be choosing our foods solely or primarily based on the nutrients that they provide for us. And that foods that are more nutrient dense um, have higher value or worth in the hierarchy of foods. And I'm very much um, a believer in intuitive eating and just really trying to focus on our relationship with food, supporting our physical and mental and emotional health. So when people are making decisions about food based solely on, well, you know, kale has lots of this and, you know, this is a high protein food that often becomes the unsustainable part because at some point the decision-making process feels like a burden. Well, should I have this? Should I not have this? Have I had enough of this? Have I earned this? And so when it comes to food, we, I think that we need to broaden our definition of what a healthy diet is and what are the kinds of foods that we should be trying to include more often and using the principles of gentle nutrition to do that versus you know, having a checklist of things that we need to get a minimum of or a maximum of. Um, you know, so I often will use the Mediterranean kind of style of eating as, you know, a nice description of you can have a food philosophy that encourages more nuts and seeds and healthy grains or whole grains, um, more fish and maybe less meat, um, you know, and more plants on your plate without it being a rule that you can't have this or you always have to have this. So, you know, I think that if people are eating in a way that is supporting their health, they don't have to look at micromanaging all the some freedom and flexibility for life. Um, and I don't think that there's a supplement that's going to fill in those gaps. Um, you know, I think that that's, that's just kind of the human experience of having to make decisions about food multiple times a day, every day of her life. It's never going to be perfect. And it probably shouldn't be. Yeah, that's awesome. I love that. I always love that little intuitive eating, like sort of talk about it because it's, it is, it's so complex. And so often we overcomplicate it when it's really simple, but I yeah, want to, I and tell people too, and, and, and which was my personal experience, my professional experience is that, um, you know, we have food matters, but not as much as we've been led to believe and not in the way that we've been led to believe, you know, food isn't medicine. And that's sometimes an unpopular opinion, but food is food. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it needs to be as much a part of our life as anything else that we do every day. And it can have, it can, you know, have benefits. Um, and it can help our health. And, and I think that we need to be conscious, but not necessarily conscientious about how we eat and what we eat um, and how it's making us feel, which is what intuitive eating, um, you know, teaches everyone. I say women all the time because that's the, that's the population I work with. But, um, you know, that we can really learn to trust our body to know what it needs and wants. Yeah. 
Wow. And I want to talk a little bit now about, I guess, the first stages. So if we look at puberty, when a child is developing and they're getting those new hormones pumping through their body, what is actually happening in the female body during that time? So much is happening. <laughs> and, you know, we sometimes call perimenopause actually second puberty um, because of the fact that in puberty, you have, you know, you're going from a low hormone state to a higher hormone state. And it's kind of the opposite in perimenopause. You're going from a high state to kind of a lower state. And so in puberty, there are some really, I think, kind of key changes that are happening that one, our estrogen receptors are becoming active um, now that the, our body is starting to produce estrogen. Um, one key thing that I think we're, and we're not telling girls, especially, is that you know their body fat percentage needs to double in order to achieve and maintain menstruation. Um, and you know, certainly it was my experience and the experience of so many women that I work with that you know that age of 11, 12, 13, and those body changes are often a kind of our first introduction to diet culture and the idea that we need to try and control the body changes that are happening. And it's met with fear and a lot of, um, you know, just kind of panic for a lot of girls. And so I try and when I work with girls and certainly with my girls and try and normalize it, yeah, your body is meant to change at this stage. Um, and, you know, and same thing for women in perimenopause, your body's changing again. We need to support you and your health through that, but we don't want to make the body change the focus of what we're doing. Um, because that's happening for a reason and you know your body's really in the driver's seat of that change and unless we're we're going to spend a lot of time and effort resisting that um you know it's it's it just shouldn't be what our focus is so for girls in, in puberty they're going through a lot of the same things which is like you know teen girls are also labeled as hormonal and you know kind of a little crazy but they're definitely going through also unpredictable changes in estrogen. They often don't have regular periods for the first several years. Um, and until things kind of settle out, which is often isn't until, you know, mid to later teens, um, it can be a wild ride. <laughs> yeah. I was about to say, how long does puberty generally last? I know every case would be different, but generally it's not something that happens overnight, but it is a long lasting thing. It, it definitely is. So, you know, thinking about, you know, that first, there are kind of different stages of puberty called the Tanner stages. Um, but, you know, that can definitely last over several years. So, for example, we know that girls typically on average will get their first period about two years after they start, you know, developing breast tissue. Um, and so it's at least a couple of years and really more likely probably up to five, I would say is, is a bit more average from the kind of start of very early stages of, you know, maybe also some body odor, maybe some hair changes to kind of a full blown, regularly menstruating woman or kind of, you know, teenage boy um, who has kind of finished growing as well. Yeah. And so what happens if someone, if we talk about the effects of entering that diet culture at that age as well, someone ends up losing their period and they become quite restrictive with their eating. Can it delay puberty? And once they regain their period, does that mean they're then going through puberty at an older age if they lost their period? Not typically, um, because a lot of the development that's happening around puberty is also in the brain, right? So we kind of have our upstairs hormones and our downstairs hormones. And so the upstairs hormone development um, isn't going, it can be certainly the um, function of it. So it, whether or not you can produce the hormones required for a period can absolutely, and we know are impacted by restriction and restrictive dieting and, and low body weight and that kind of stuff. Um, but I don't know that the timeline of development would change. Yeah. Okay. And what happens in the body when I guess someone does restrict their eating and lose their period? What, why does that process happen? Why do we lose our period? It's something called hypothalamic amenorrhea. And so the hypothalamus is the part of the upstairs hormone um, production that produces the hormones that tells our ovaries to start maturing the follicles. And when we're not eating enough, that can be a stress on our body. Um, and if we're you know, losing uh, weight, and if it, especially if it's because of restriction, 
our body's going to prioritize survival over reproduction. And so reproduction, you know, comes at an energetic cost, you know, strictly speaking. And so it really just kind of shuts it down and says, you know what, we don't need to do that right now or doing that is going to come at too great of a cost. And so it kind of shuts it all down. But ovulation is a key event in our cycle. And, you know, so all of the estrogen is is kind of geared towards build, maturing the egg and preparing the lining. And then progesterone is about kind of keeping the lining a nice cozy place for an egg that fertilizes to land. But those hormones, because it affects more than just our uterus, are intimately connected with our mood and our energy and how we just feel in general. So if someone isn't having a regular ovulatory event, and especially in conjunction with restriction or um, an eating disorder, it really affects how they feel. So it's, you know, a pre the period is a, is a very important barometer in any woman's health. Um, and so if you're not having a period, then that's not normal unless you're in your 40s and 50s. And then that brings me to the question about the pill, because obviously you take that for contraception, but then again, it also sends a false period for a woman because it stops that ovulating process. Is that good for a woman, woman then to stop that, that ovulation? I think that that's a really difficult yes or no answer. So, um, you know, I think, so first of all, um, the birth control pill is, um, a valid birth control choice. And so I think that for some women, it is the best choice. Um, and I would never want to try and dissuade someone who felt like that that's what they needed um, for birth control, because that's, you know, kind of top priority women's rights is, you know, being able to control their body's reproduction. Um, I think secondly, there are some instances where um, changing the hormonal landscape can have benefit. So um, women who maybe have a physical condition, maybe women who are at increased risk for um, ovarian cancer, there are kind of some specific situations where changing the hormonal landscape, even if just temporarily, may have some benefit. But I think that, we, that the pill is misprescribed for many, many women. It doesn't regulate your period. Um, so if you have an irregular period that tells us that you're not ovulating regularly, the pill doesn't fix that. It just creates what's called a pill bleed, right? So, or a withdrawal bleed. It builds up the lining, and then when you cut away the hormones, the lining sheds. And so it's not a period, it's not a cycle, it's just a withdrawal bleed. And for and it, the, the hormones that are used to do that, some women don't feel their best taking them. So some women are very sensitive to the estrogen. Um, some women experience side effects from the progestin, which is the synthetic um, progesterone-like uh, substance that they use. Um, but it is not encouraging regular, healthy, normal cycles. So, and women generally feel their best when that's happening. Not all women. And so, like I said, I would never want to kind of say it's not a yes or no answer, but I don't think that the wider medical community really communicates to women that it doesn't regulate your period. Um, it changes the hormonal landscape that can benefit some women at some points in their life. And it's a valid birth control choice because it does control ovulation. And that's kind of what you're trying to do with birth control. Um, but it, it doesn't usually fix anything. Yeah. Do you think women understand their bodies as much as I guess they should? Um, not as much as I think we should, because I'm always shocked um, when I work with women who are in their 40s and 50s, who have had children or not had children, um, who really just don't understand what, what's happening, you know? And so there was a really interesting, there's been a couple of surveys, but there was an interesting one done in the UK last year of 700 women. And I think it was something like 45% of them didn't know the difference between perimenopause and menopause. Um, a similar percentage were surprised when perimenopause happened. Um, on average, I've read that, you know, women are misdiagnosed for four to five years before someone actually can, you know, adequately, you know, slot them into that, oh, I think all of your symptoms might be perimenopausal. So they're, you know, misdiagnosed um, and mistreated, right? Not given appropriate treatments. So I, one of the things that I do, and I have an online course called the Thinking Woman's Guide to Menopause and Perimenopause, which is 
really geared at the education piece of, okay, this is what you need to know. These are the signs and symptoms that things are starting to change. That can happen as early as 35. Um, so if you're noticing, you know, three of these symptoms and this is happening, then maybe you're here. These are the types of symptoms that can happen here. These are the signs that you're moving on to the next stage. These are, you know, and I think that that's part of that, you know, almost like a prenatal course for perimenopause that if we start teaching women and girls from a young age and normalizing that this is just another phase of their reproductive life, they won't end up as one of those 45% who don't know the difference. You know, I like to sometimes use the analogy of what would we say if, you know, 40% of women who got pregnant were surprised that they were pregnant. Yeah. We would say that we were failing at sex ed incredibly. Yeah. <laughs> so it's the Definitely. same kind of thing. Yeah. Wow, it is. And it, I feel like there's such a lack of education around menopause, especially like around my age, we're kind of, because we're not there yet, we kind of don't even look at it or don't even, and don't get ourselves prepared for it. And it's amazing how much it, it takes, I guess, over our lives and how much we should be aware of it because our bodies do change. Yeah, they do. And they're supposed to, mm. um, you know, it's, it's not, it should never be about stopping it or um, resisting it. It, you know, I use the analogy of it's about taking the paved road versus the bumpy road. You're going to get the other way. Every single woman on the planet goes through this. this. It doesn't spare anyone, whether you go through it naturally, surgically, medically induced, every single woman at some point is in their non-reproductive years. And um, if we just normalize it as something that happens, um, then it becomes less taboo to talk about. It becomes more dinner table conversation um, and not kind of, you know, in a quiet office with a medical practitioner. Yeah. And when you talked about, so you can go through it surgically, is that uh, like a hysterectomy? It can be. So often when hysterectomies are done now, they try and spare the ovaries. And so unless they need to, um, they won't take the ovaries. And so if a woman has a hysterectomy, loses her uterus, but still has her ovaries, she generally does not go through any of the perimenopausal symptoms earlier. But if she also loses her ovaries, then she goes into kind of immediate menopause. And it can be very much, um, it can be a rough transition um, for women. And some women are better supported than others. I think that surgical menopause where the ovaries are taken is um, a very compelling case for using hor uh, menopause hormone replacement therapy, especially in those early months to help ease that transition. Um, and especially if it's done under the age of 40, because not have losing all of your estrogen in your thirties um, isn't going to be in your best interest. Well, so you still go through hormone, I mean, not hormones, you still go through menopause, even when you lose or have a hysterectomy. Yeah, because the uterus is, is basically just the holding tank. Um, you know, it doesn't produce hormones. Um, it has tissue that responds to hormones, um, but it is, you know, it's mainly a vessel um, to prepare for a baby. And, you know, and that's why in some really kind of extreme circumstances, they've been able to have 60 year old women carry pregnancies because the uterus doesn't age in the same way that our ovaries do and that the eggs and the ovaries do. Yeah. And that's what I was going to ask as well. So even after you go through menopause or if you're going through menopause, can you still fall pregnant? So when you're in perimenopause, yes. So we tell women that in order to confirm that you are no longer fertile um, and don't need to use birth control, you need to be in menopause. So have not had a period for 12 months and have at least two blood test readings of the hormone FSH above 30 taken kind of six to eight weeks apart. Um, in that instance, we can say, yes, this isn't going to happen for you anymore. Um, but, you know, there are a lot of women who have surprise pregnancies in their 40s um, because they assumed that they weren't fertile or thought that the risk was low. But um, because our ovaries actually sputter towards menopause, there are some months when women are more fertile. And that's why the risk of um, the chance of fraternal twins is actually increased for women over the age of 40. Because women statistically um, are more likely to ovulate two eggs in their 40s in perimenopause than they were before. So, 
Wow. And how does the, the body react as the eggs get older? And if you do fall pregnant, can there be issues because of the, the older eggs and also the body is already, I guess, changed? Yeah, it really has more to do with the eggs. Um, so like I said, the, the uterus itself doesn't seem to be as involved, but the number and quality of eggs declining means that the risk of um, something going wrong with the pregnancy or not being able to carry the pregnancy to term does increase. So the risk of miscarriage significantly increases over the age of 37 and then again over 40. Um, so the way that I describe it is that, you know, in our 20s and, and early 30s, which is kind of our peak reproductive years, our body can choose the best of the best every month. And so when you're kind of digging at the bottom of the barrel, sometimes it's you get what you get. And as a result of that, it, it can definitely impact chances of pregnancy and also successful pregnancy. It's so fascinating. And the more I learn about the body, the more I'm just more and more intrigued because it is it's just so phenomenal the the woman's body and we just we don't know enough about it but yet it, it's just so fascinating how the processes work how the hormones complement each other it's it's really a phenomenal process really yeah we really do swim in hormonal soup and you know as the those soup ingredients change um, not just with perimenopause, but also other hormones can be involved like thyroid hormone or the stress hormone cortisol, uh, testosterone, you know, as that the soup ingredients change, how we feel changes. And so it's not just about one hormone or two hormones. It's really about how they all work together. And, um, and that can change how we feel. Now, I want to ask a question that I did happen to find online kind of a while ago when I was searching my own sort of period stuff. And one of them said, and I want to know if it's true or not, but one of the comments made on a newspaper article was that women's hormones, when we are at our peak or estrogens being produced the most, it actually attracts men. Is that true? You know, I don't know that that's... That I, I can't comment on that scientifically um, yeah. because that's not kind of an area that I've researched. Um, yeah. You know, I think that the, the pheromone research might um, be impacted by changing estrogen levels. Certainly women's attraction to men likely yeah. does. So it makes sense that it would, um, that it would have an influence, but yeah, I think that's out of my wheelhouse. Yeah. I was just thinking when I was reading the article and it was kind of saying how, when both sort of genders are producing hormones like their hormones bring each other together and i was like hmm, is this just like a movie sort of newspaper thing or is this real i think that there definitely is something about uh to be said for estrogen increasing um like i said a woman's attraction to a partner um increasing interest in in you know have, being intimate with that partner um, but I don't know, I, I couldn't explain the exact interplay. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll leave that question alone. We'll leave that to someone else to discover out. Um, now, I want to talk a little bit about you. So your journey into where you are now, why did you decide to start your practice and to start learning about this, this environment? Well, I think that um, it was kind of a natural it was just kind of a natural evolution. So um, I became um, licensed as a dietitian in 2000 and as a naturopathic doctor in 2004 and started um, practicing in Dartmouth and Nova Scotia and Canada and really just evolved to work with women throughout the reproductive life cycle. So I was in a stage where I was having kids um, and then, you know, young children. And so I was working a lot with women in that age group. And then as I transitioned into perimenopause and was one of those women who started quite early at 36 or 37, um, I, I think it was just made really clear to me that there was such a gap, um, you know, in the information that was available to women about not just the physical experience, but the emotional experience, because that is just as valid. Um, you know, estrogen is our nurturing hormone. And so it encourages us to take care of things, whether that's a cat, a plant, a child, a partner, a house, a job, whatever, it's our nurturing hormone. And as that starts to shift, our priorities often shift, that can, our interests shift, um, you know, and that can be very, I don't want to say upsetting, but it, 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 it can be disconcerting, you know, as a woman to feel like, um, you're not the same as you were 10 years ago emotionally. So 
I think I started to realize that there was a real gap there. And of course, since a lot of the work that I do with women in midlife is around intuitive eating and developing a healthy relationship with food and feeling good about their body, it became clear to me that diet culture really preyed on women in this stage of life and, you know, telling them that they needed to do more and restrict more and that they were losing their youthfulness and all of these crazy things um, because their bodies were changing. And so normalizing that and supporting women to find food freedom and body confidence kind of became my number one mission. And, um, and so educating, supporting, empowering, the, those are the three things that are, that are my whys. Mm, wow. It's, it's phenomenal. I don't know how many articles that I've seen on celebrity magazines. It's like fabulous at 40, be your best at 50 or uh, wrinkle free. It, there's that many advertising out there that it's promoting this, this lifestyle that we should strive to be at in the forties and fifties and sort of avoid accepting our natural bodies process. And it's kind of sad to think that we're, we're trying to avoid that process when it's actually quite beautiful. It is. And, you know, as a, as someone who's kind of, you know, knocking on the door of 44 um, and knocking on the door of menopause, I, I try and tell women that, you know, this is an, a wonderful time in my life. Um, I have more confidence than I ever had in my twenties and thirties. I am more sure of what I want and don't want um, and have no problem saying no um, to, you know, things that don't serve me or, you know, that I don't want to do. And, you know, embracing the fact that this new hormonal soup that I'm in means that I get to kind of get to know myself all over again. That's a gift. Mm. Um, you know, we're not who we are for, you know, we're not one person for our whole life. We're constantly growing and changing and evolving. And I love the message that women don't need to fear being 40 and 50 in midlife. And I, I love that there's definitely kind of a, a rising of support, uh, especially on social media. There's some really great people doing some great work. Um, I just don't like when, you know, diet culture kind of in the anti-aging fear of aging um, message is at the forefront of that discussion because it just doesn't need to be. Did you used to be scared of that midlife, that menopausal period? Yeah, I think like all women, it was something that in some ways I looked forward to because, you know, the idea of not having to deal with a period every month is super exciting. Um, I also... Yeah. I also had endometriosis um, or have endometriosis. So I had a lot of pain associated with my period. So um, again, another reason to kind of look forward to it. But I think that for me, it was just always a big gap in, in what I thought it was. As a 20 year old, I probably didn't think about it at all, but what I thought I knew was really just about hot flashes and not having a period. Um, I didn't really understand that there was going to be a lot of change and that if I can be an active participant in that change, um, that, you know, it can be an amazing time of my life, that it isn't an ending. It's just another beginning to be cheesy. So. <laughs> and how do you feel about your body now going, as you said, you're knocking on the door of menopause. Are you, I guess, at the stage where you're ready for it and you're, you're happy with your body and there are some days that do still suck a little bit. Yeah, I mean, as someone who had, um, a, I think, a typical pattern of disordered eating that started in my teens, um, this, you know, the midlife body changes were something that I think if I hadn't become well versed in intuitive eating and learning to, you know, support my body at any size, that it would have been more terrifying. Um, you know, I can see the changes now. But I don't see those changes as reflective of anything that I've done wrong um, or anything that I need to do something about because I'm focusing on my overall health in ways that actually matter. I'm you know, learning to listen to my body and respond when it wants food or rest or pleasure or movement. Um, you know, and that because of that, I, because of that, I guess, intention to respect my body, I have the confidence now that I never had. Um, you know, in the earlier part of my life. And do you think education is one of the key factors to you being confident in your body now? And a, a, I guess a larger understanding of what's going on in your body so that you can appreciate it? Of course, it has to be. Because if we don't start talking to women about why all of this is happening and giving them 
evidence-based information about why it's happening, you know, we, we blame ourselves. We think we're doing something wrong. Um, you know, we turn to or are victims of bad information. Um, and so, you know, education is, you know, knowledge is power and educating women about this is totally normal. Um, it's not your fault. You know, I, I use a lot of analogies, but especially pregnancy analogies. And so, you know, like when, when someone is pregnant and they're experiencing morning sickness, we're not telling them it's their fault. We're acknowledging it. We're supporting them. We're offering them treatments. We're, you know, we're holding their hand. We're doing all of that, but we're not telling them they did something wrong or that they should have done something different or if they tried harder, they wouldn't feel this way. And it's very much the same way. We need to say, these things happen. Um, and here are the choices that you can make with your care providers about you know, how you can cope with these changes, but it's not your fault and you didn't do anything wrong. That's beautiful. And it's such a lovely message. And I hope that anyone watching out there that are, you know, as we said, knocking on that, that pre-menopausal or even on that menopause door to know that it is not your fault. And that there is education and a whole lot of information out there, not diet culture, but fabulous people like Jen who are informing people across the world about menopause. And I want to thank you so much for coming on today and sharing your story and also giving us a little insight into menopause. I know I have learnt so much and <laughs> I know I'm going to go home and um, sit back and start researching so that I can be ready and confident for that period when it does come. Thank you so much for having me. It's, uh, it's been lovely chatting with you. Oh, awesome. And where can we find you? Um, the best place is to follow me on Instagram. So you can find me at menopause.nutritionist. Um, it's kind of one of my favorite places to um, engage with people and, um, and kind of share what I want to share with people. But you can also find me at jensaleephuber.ca, which is my website. Beautiful. Well, thank you guys all so much for joining us. And again, Jen, thank you so much. It is phenomenal, all the work that you're doing and the journey that you've come on. So thank you. Thanks so much. That's all right. We'll see you guys all next time. Have a great Sunday.